All right, good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about fixed axis rotation. Um, so we're going to start with some coordinate systems and terminology. And all right, so we're often going to use at least if not explicitly use radial coordinates, we're going to use stuff that is where it's helpful to understand what we mean by radial coordinates. Um, so you're used to x and y axes, but we also talk about the, um, the position vector r um, and the angle theta. In a physics class, theta is defined as the angle between r and the position vector. If you have something which is rotating um, with a constant radius, um, it sweeps out uh, an arc length, S, and this, and S is equal to R theta. So then, um, if you sweep out an entire circle, the arc length is equal to 2 pi times the radius. So that actually does make sense um, with what you're already familiar with. Okay, so then um, <clears throat> We define an, a, a vector um, theta that is in the z. Well, I actually would prefer on this notation that they use a theta hat because it's a unit vector. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we have the angle vector pointing along the z axis. This is somewhat different from some of the other textbooks, um, but we'll go with it because this is the textbook you're using. Um, and you have a position vector and an arc length vector in the xy plane. All three vectors are perpendicular, so this is an alternate coordinate system that you could use instead of x, y, z, um, r, s, and theta. Um, and we often have unit vectors in each of those defining the um, defining <clears throat> a vector of length one um, and we can use this set of coordinates instead. Okay, so then um, if you have two different particles, we wanna talk about things that are rotating. So if you have two different particles or two different spots along a disk that, um, are, that is rotating, they have different tangential speeds depending on the axis. So if you're standing, if you're standing still, if you're standing right in the middle, you're standing still, you're just rotating, but you don't have any, um, you're not moving, your, your center of mass stays in the same spot. You, as you move further out, you're going, you're traveling a greater length. Um, so we want, to, we want to try to quantify this. Um, and we actually can relate that tangential velocity um, to the angular um, frequency. So this is a number of radians swept out per second. Um, and the translational velocity is the radius of whatever it is times the angular velocity. So since we had that the, um, the, the arc length swept out was r theta, if we take a derivative, the change in, um, in the arc length per unit time is r v theta v omega. And this guy right here is just the angular velocity. Um, so, and this is the translational instantaneous, um, sorry, the instantaneous tangential velocity. All right, and we want to, um, define this angular velocity as a vector. And you'll understand a little bit more why more later when we get into the nitty gritty um, and we're trying to use this angular velocity vector. 
So you're going to take your fingers and curl so that your finger, use your right hand all the time, use your fingers so that they curl in the direction of motion and your thumb points in the direction of the angular velocity. Um, so then you can, wherever it is, so if you have something rotating like a bicycle wheel, you're rolling forward, you curl your fingers with the rotation and your thumb points in the direction of the angular velocity. It's gonna take you a while practicing this to really, um, to really nail it down. Okay, so then if we have a rotation, um, now we're going to go, if you were looking down on the XY plane, you are going to go um, in the, your rotation is going to go counterclockwise looking in the XY plane. So if I draw the rotation here, you have a circle here, you're rotating like this. Um, you can do R cross V, and that's going to give you the direction of the angular velocity. Um, or curl your fingers with the rotation and your thumb points in the direction of the angular velocity. Um, if you are rotating clockwise, you can do the same thing, but now to curl your fingers with the rotation, you have to flip your hand upside down. So your angular velocity is down. Now in our coordinate system, in <clears throat> this first one, the angular velocity is in the positive Z direction. And in the second one, it's in the negative Z direction. You're gonna practice this a lot. Um, also, um, you want to, you can write down some cheat sheet to help you remember which way it goes. Okay. <laughs> now, the angular acceleration is the change in the angular velocity. So, d alpha, which is also going to be a vector, dt is d omega dt. Okay, so if you are spinning clockwise and speeding up, alpha is in the same direction as omega because you would add alpha, the vector alpha to the vector omega. So if you're speeding up, the angular acceleration is upwards if you're spinning clockwise, but slowing down, the angular acceleration is downwards because you have to, um, you have to add your angular acceleration vector to, um, you have to add your angular acceleration vector to the um, angular velocity vector. all this over, you need to know this forwards and backwards. Okay, so then we move on to some examples. All right, you have a wind turbine. Which way is that going? I'm gonna curl my fingers. I'm not sure that this, this works in, in Zoom um, because you see me, yeah, you see me forward, you see me head on, so I think I have to reverse everything. Okay, so I'm gonna curl my fingers with the rotation. I think, you get, I think I have to do it the right way. Um, I'm gonna curl my fingers with the rotation and um, <clears throat> then I see the, um, I see the, that my thumb points outwards at me. So if I am, um, oh, there we go, didn't mean to do that. If I am trying to figure out the direction of the angular rotation, um, then this angular velocity is outward. 
Um, so we have notations just as a refresher. This one means out of the board or out of the paper. This means into the paper. It's just like if you had an arrow and you were looking down the arrow. So if the arrow is pointing at you, you see the tip, which is like looks like a little tiny dot in the middle. If you are looking at the back of the hour, the, the arrow, you see the, the feathers on the back, which are called fletchings. Um, all right. Here, a fishing line comes off of the rotating reel um, and moves. The, the fishing line is moving linearly. Um, so I'm going to curl my fingers with the rotation. I can find that. Um, let's see, this is the rod. So it is going to be pointing out towards me. It's counterclockwise as I'm looking at it. So um, it's in this direction. Um, and if it is moving linear, if it is increasing um, linearly with time, then it is going to be a constant angular acceleration because the, the reel is moving at a constant speed. If it were me fishing, it would be going somewhere bad. Last time I got, I went fishing was my best trip ever. I only caught two trees. Not good at fishing. All right, so um, you can, just like we had when you had, um, we worked with linear, um, linear acceleration um, and linear motion, um, you can plot the angular quantities as a function of time. So here, if this is an angular velocity as a function of time, um, that angular velocity, we usually use the symbol omega. And the slope of that curve is d omega dt, which we denote as alpha. All right. And if you want to know how much has, um, how many, um, how far it's gone, um, the arc length is going to be the radius. Well, actually, sorry, this would be the total. This as written would be the angle swept out is going to be um, the integral of d, uh, or sorry, the integral of omega is a function of time. dt, which is just the area under the curve. Um, if we have a constant angular velocity, which is what this looks like, this angle is a function of, and it looks like it starts with omega naught, and then this is decelerating. But in general, we would write angular velocity is the initial angular velocity times alpha times time. Um, and you can just integrate that, um, integrate the angular velocity as a function of time. Um, if you haven't reached that point in calculus, that integral is equivalent to the area under the curve. If I do this using calculus, um, I get omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. In this case, alpha is negative. Um, so if I do this using area, on, so, so this would not be, I just wanted to use a, the regular sign conventions. Um, all right, if I had to calculate this as an area, this intercept is omega naught. Um, and then if, uh, as I go down to here, this is omega naught plus alpha 
p, where alpha is negative. Um, and then my width of this is T or delta T. My, um, so I want for a triangle, I have a width of one half times the height times the base. And with numbers, we would have to plug in that the base is this, this intercept is when this guy equals zero. So it's when I have T equals negative omega naught over alpha. Okay, I didn't totally prepare for going through this. If you, um, and if you do it out the long way, you will find that both of them give the same answer. All right, uniform circular motion. In, so this is when you move at a constant velocity. We sort of kind of lightly touched on this when we did, um, when we briefly introduced the, um, we talked about the velocity of something moving at constant acceleration. Um, and then uh, here you have a centripetal acceleration. So pointing towards centripetal means pointing towards the center. Be careful not to use centrifugal because that's, an, that's a fictitious force that you, if you were in the rotating system, you, it, it would look like, um, it would look like um, it were always, if you were in the rotating system, you would think you have a force pointing towards the center. Um, and then um, if, okay, so if you have uniform sin, sin circular motion, the accelerations vector is always inward toward, towards the axis. There is no um, tangential acceleration non-uniform um, circular motion, you can have both. So if you're speeding up and slowing down, you actually will, or speeding up or slowing down, you will actually have both. Um, so of course, this tangential acceleration is, um, the, the tangential speed is, the, is V equals R omega. So if omega is constant, your tangential speed is zero. If omega is moving, you do have a tangential acceleration. All right. So in this case, you have, uh, you have something which is accelerating and moving in circular motion. Um, and the total acceleration is the sum of both. Sometimes you have to consider both the centripetal and the tang tangential acceleration. Um, and here, if you have something slowing down, so this shows an example where you have something speeding up going counterclockwise. So the acceleration is, um, the acceleration is always gonna be towards the center, um, the angular, the centripetal acceleration is towards the center. The tangential acceleration, if it's going counterclockwise and speeding up, is tangential and pointing sort of counterclockwise. Oh, but also just to point out that tangential acceleration is going to be different everywhere. Um, because oh, that last line's a mistake. Um, 
if you have something which is slowing down, then the tangential acceleration points in the opposite direction. Yeah, so this one doesn't have direction of motion, this one does. All right, moments of inertia. So this is an analog to the mass, but for rotational motion. Um, the moment of inertia measures how hard it is to get something rotating, just like the, the mass tells you how hard it is to get something accelerating linearly. Um, for point particles, the moment of inertia is m times the, the mass of the, of the point times the radius from the axis of rotation squared. So whereas mass is a constant property of, of something, the moment of inertia is different depending on where you're rotating from. Um, so if you are, um, ah, actually my equation here has a mistake. We're gonna fix it on the fly um, because I don't want to divide by M in this one. All right, so the moment of inertia is just, and ah, I don't know why I put that. I did the same mistake on this side. That is also wrong here. Um, so the moment of inertia is the measure of how far stuff is from the center, because it's harder to rotate things if they're further from the center. All right, so here you have a simple case where you have six little points along a line, um, like beads along a roughly massless rod. Um, so if you wanted, so to define the moment of inertia, you would, oh, you would have to, um, oh, let me go back here. There, you can also do this in integral form and then you multiply by a small segment of mass. And when you do a small segment of mass, you are often doing, you might do the density times the volume. So you end up doing a triple integral, which most of you haven't seen, but they're not as scary as they sound. It just means do an integrals three times. Um, you also can have, uh, um, you can do it in two dimensions where if you have a disc, you're approximating it as a two dimensional thing. So then you have an, uh, a, an area, a density per unit area, and then times the area, that's a double integral or a line integral, which is just a linear density times the, um, times the length, a small unit of length. When you get to upper division classical mechanics, you will do a lot of those integrals um, and you will be expected to just know how to do triple integrals, but we're not gonna cover them yet. Okay, so now you have these three, um, you, you have these points upon, a, upon the rod. So, and then this, this would be five centimeters because they're evenly spaced. Um, if you want the moment of inertia, you have to know what the axis of rotation is because it will be different. If you chose an axis of rotation along the rod, moment of inertia is zero because the distance from the center of the rod is zero for all of them, approximately. Now, really, if you had real washers like this describes, they would have some width and your, your rod would not be massless. Okay, so if we wanted to calculate this, you have two masses, which are five centimeters away. So two times 25 centimeters squared. I'm not using SI units, it's easier to write out. And then you have two masses, which are, and I wasn't given the mass anyways, two masses, which are 15 centimeters squared. And then you have two ma away, and then you have two masses, which are 25 centimeters squared. So that's all you would do to figure out the moment of inertia of something configured like that. These different objects can get rather complicated. Um, when you do the, um, when you need to have a moment of inertia, it, it is a skill you will be required to master at a later class where you actually do the integrals to figure them out, but we're not gonna do it in this class because this class has calculus as a, calc one is a co-requisite. 
so I can't assume you can get these girls. Um, so here are the moments of inertia for a whole bunch of different common objects. These are not derived by magic. It's just a bunch of integrals, not magic, just math. Um, and you can add them all up. Um, or so you, can, you can do these integrals, you can tally them up. So there's tables and books. Most of the time, it's nice to just look it up in a table um, sometime, but you do have to be able to do the integrals as a physics major, um, but not in this class. The parallel axis theorem is very useful because notice in this table, um, each of these different entries tells you what it is rotating about. Um, and you can rotate about different axes. So the parallel axis theorem tells you what to do if you are rotating about an axis parallel to the one that's given. So here, I'm actually gonna go through this list and draw some parallel axes, which axes which would be parallel. So here you rotate a hoop, but it's not about the center, it's about something um, perpendicular. So the hoop is then going, I, I don't know if I can, yeah, like this instead of about the center. Um, here, if you're rotating a sphere, not about its center, but about something um, parallel to it. Um, if you do this slab here, you can rotate the slab um, about an axis parallel to the center, but not exactly the center. Um, this is rotating the hoop through the center, not the, the very, not the center of the circle, but so that it is like this. And this would be instead rotating it like that. So that's where the parallel axis theorem can be used. And it's useful because often it is easiest to do these integrals about the center of mass of some object. And if you can do that, you can actually just, um, you can calculate the, um, the, the moment of inertia from something that you're also more likely to be able to look up in a table. Um, so you take the moment of inertia about the, the center of mass and you can just add um, m, the mass of the object, times the distance from the, axis, the center of mass squared. So it's a nice little trick. So here, um, if you have a set of barbells and you've calculated, well, this one's easy because this, the moment of inertia of, we're gonna just model these disks as um, point masses. So your moment of inertia is two because there's two barbells, M capital R squared. And now I'm gonna rotate about one center and my moment of inertia is two M R squared plus the total mass of the object times the distance from the center of mass quantity squared. So that's my moment of inertia. All right, you can do the same thing here. You're rotating about a disc. You're rotating a disc about of radius r, but here you're l away from the edge, which also means that you are l plus r away from the center of mass. So you'd look up the moment of inertia of a disc about its center, and uh, which is one. The moment of inertia of a disk about its center is one half m r squared. And then you're going to add m l plus r quantity squared. And then you don't have to do ugly integrals, which are a lot harder to do <laughs> if you can't rotate, if you can't set your coordinate system in the center. 
All right, you can do this um, spheres instead. The basic idea is the same, except I admit I don't have the moment of inertia of a sphere memorized. I'd have to look it up. Um, but you're just going to add the, you're just going to calculate the distance from the center of mass and, um, and calculate M times the distance from the center of mass squared. Okay, so here, um, ah, this actually is, this doesn't belong in this section because you don't need the parallel axis theorem for this. So here you can add moments of inertia. Um, moments of inertia are additive. So you have, if you have the moment of inertia of a child on a merry-go-round, you can add the moment of inertia of the merry-go-round, the moment of inertia of the child, and that gives you the net moment of inertia. Again, this is analogous to masses. If you had masses of objects, um, and so here you can, we're going to model the boy as a point particle because this is an intro physics class, and that's the type of thing we do. Um, so you would have the total moment of inertia, inertia as the moment of inertia of the merry-go-round plus one half times the mass of the boy times the radius of the boy squared. All right, and this type of problem you could solve as well, the using the parallel axis theorem, because you can look up what the moment of inertia of a rod is about its center of mass. Its center of mass is L over two. Um, so if you broke this into chunks, if you broke this rod into pieces six, uh, one sixth long. So here's your um, center of mass. Excuse me. Um, and then your distance from the center of mass here is going to be one third L. Um, and then you could figure out the moment of inertia without having to set up big, long, ugly integrals. And here we have the same typo that I had earlier. So we're going to correct it on the fly. Um, OK, so if you do have to do the integrals, here, this is a, um, I will do some setup, but not actually do them. Here you have the, we're gonna, we have the axis of rotation there. Um, you're going to calculate the, you use R squared, so the radius squared, dm. And let's say that this is a um, flat object, and we're going to put our x-axis here, and this is going to be z, and then I have y out of the plane. Um, if I were writing this in coordinates, my r is always going to be x, so I have x squared. And then I would have to write the density, uh, the, uh, the area density, as a function of x and z, because it's going to depend on that. And then I would have to integrate over the area, which in this case would be dx dz. So I would have a double integral. Okay, a slightly easier case would be a, you know, the rod, if you had to actually do, a, um, if you had to actually integrate a rod, um, 
they'll integrate over a rod. So here, this one's a little bit, this one's easier. So we're gonna define a linear density. Our linear density um, is the length of the rod over the mass of the rod. So I still want to have I equals integral of R squared. In this case, R squared is always X squared. Now, a small unit of mass is the length over the total mass and then dx. Small unit of mass, so I actually would write, would correct there. dm is not, it scales with dx, but it's not dx. And then I have to set up the integral limits. It's going to go from negative L over 2 to L over 2. So here I get x cubed over 3 from L over 2 to L over 2. So I get L over M times L I should end up with ah totally dumb mistake I inverted I want this to be M over L, not L over M. Duh. Okay, so what did I do that I caught my mistake? I was checking units. I am, I do this automatically as a physicist now. I want to see that the units end up something like M R squared, mass times length squared, and my units were totally off. So as I, as I tell you guys in class all the time, the difference between an experienced physicist and a novice is not whether or not you make dumb mistakes, it's whether or not you catch them and how quickly you catch them. So checking units, something I do in the back of my head all the time. All right, so here now we've got L cubed over eight, and there's two of them, and I still have my factor of three. Um, so cancel stuff out and I end up with 1 12th ML squared. So that's a simple one, relatively simple. You can do the same thing um, about a different axis. We will leave it as an exercise for the student to show that, this, that the parallel axis theorem actually holds. Um, so I can set up my integral. I still have x squared mass over length dx. And actually here I can already check my units. I should have caught it earlier. Um, I have three things with, uni with, um, with units of length, x squared and x. So I have length cubed and then times mass divided by length. So I end up with mass times length squared. That's good, that's what I want. The difference here between this one and the other one is what my integral limits are. So I have the same basic idea, um, but my limits are different. In this case, slightly easier. And I get one third ML squared. Okay, over a disk, it's a little harder. You have two different ways that you can set this up. You can try to set it up as an, a density per unit area, or you can figure out the, the mass of a small ch chunk in, you can either do a two dimensional integral and radiate and integrate over area, or you can do a one dimensional integral and integrate over R. But then your, your integration region is small strips. 
I tend to be better at setting up the two dimensional integrals. So I tend to do it that way. So then your um, density is mass over pi r squared. And then you would, I would do radial coordinates, um, r squared, and then a small unit of area is r b r d theta. Integration limits are zero to r over r and zero to two pi over theta. So for me, at least, that is a much easier way to set up the integral. Um, you can also do it as here you still have r squared. Now we can do the density per unit area um, times a small strip. Your strip has unit it is has area two pi r that's the circumference of the strip times r b uh, i do a i want to do two pi r times r dr and that should that will give you the same length so then if I, tr then this whole mess is my small unit of mass. And the reason I don't tend to like doing it that way is because I am prone to making stupid mistakes when I do it that way. I find it much easier to set up the big long two dimensional integral and do two integrals. All right, torque. Torque is the, um, at, is the distance from the um, axis of rotation to the um, point at which you apply the force, cross product of that with the force. Um, so torque is analogous to, the, to a force. Torque is what gets something rotating. So this is also why you use um, something like a crowbar if you want to pull something off the, um, if you want to take stuff apart, your, uh, the crowbar gives you a longer moment arm, so it gives you a larger torque. And torque is also equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So the analogs to linear, moment, to linear motion are force equals ma, and there's not really an analog to the definition of torque. That's just the definition. But the, so this torque is going to tell you how fast things are going to start, ro how easily they're going to start rotating. So here's a bunch of different examples. Um, if you have a door and you're pushing on the door, it is easiest to open the door if you push towards the, the edge. The torque on the door is largest if your moment arm is large. If your moment arm is small, it's harder to open the door. It is also easiest to open the door if you are pushing perpendicular to the door than if you are pushing parallel to the door because the only component which contributes to the torque is the part which is perpendicular to the door. So here, this is the component perpendicular, and this is the component parallel. The component parallel does not contribute any torque because we have a cross product. All right, so torque is R cross F. So here, R cross F, you're going to use your right hand put your fingers along with R, rotate it in the direction of F, F, and that gives you the torque. Um, here, you have a, 
disc rotating um, about its axis through the center. Um, you apply a force, but it is not exactly perpendicular to the moment arm. When you apply a force that is parallel to R, you get zero torque. When you apply it perpendicular to R, you get the maximum torque. All right, you can calculate the torques. This is a classic, simple example. Um, you would just do R cross F. In, the, in this case, they are perpendicular. So you would have a torque of four, time, uh, four meters times 40 Newtons, um, or 160 Newton meters. In this, and we're going to clear that out. In this case, they are also perpendicular. This is easy. You have three meters times 60 newtons, so or times 20 newtons, so you have 60 newton meters. There's a few ways you can do this. For the others, um, you can, the um, moment arm is here. The component perpendicular is only one meter. So here you would have R cross F is 20 Newton meters. You also could calculate the length of that um, force and then use this angle right here. But as I say, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. I'm not gonna do that. All right, so here the component perpendicular is, on, is two meters. So you would have two meters times 30 newtons, so you would have 60 newton meters. All right. And if you have three forces, torques are additive, so you would have to add all three torques together to get the net torque on the, um, on the object. And in this case, so I'm gonna go through and draw R cross F. R, so I'm going to, in for this guy, I'm going to rotate it that way. R cross F is out of the board. For this one, I'm going to put it, I'm going to shift this there. Uh, the arrow is a little confusing. So we're going to delete that arrow. Okay, R cross F is still out of the board. Ah, except that, no, it's not, because for the R that is relevant, the force is, the R that's relevant is here for this one. And this is there. So now I do R cross F and I get a torque which is into the board. And then finally, this R is here and it is parallel to the third force. So it gives you zero net torque. So you have to consider where the force is applied. So the R's are different for each of these three um, torques. And we're actually going to take an intermission and I'm going to do more examples in a se separate recording because this one's so long.